First, I want to just uh, remark on these headlines that we had, as Steve was mentioning, you know, kind of surprising here about this scrapping of a visit that nobody even knew about, right, to, uh, to the DMZ, uh, which is breaking with tradition of former presidents from Ronald Reagan on. Uh, in fact, you know, Trump's vice president went to the DMZ earlier this year. So uh, did he miss an opportunity not going there? Uh, that was breaking news to me, too, that there was thought of going to the DMZ. Uh, no, I think this is actually a, a prudent thing to do, given the level of, of tensions uh, on the Korean Peninsula right now, given the fact that others from the Trump administration have, as you said, visited. Uh, he may well have another chance to come back to South Korea. I imagine he will, if, uh, if precedence is a guide, and perhaps he can do it then. But I think, uh, I think the White House and the president has done the right thing in focusing on what I think was the, the really must-do of this first trip. Uh, for him to, to our ally in South Korea, and that is to reassure the South Koreans uh, about the alliance, uh, about his readiness to work together with their new president, uh, and to work together on not only the defense of the Korean Peninsula, but hmm. to prevent war. What did you make of his softening tone on North Korea? I, I think he got the message, one, from uh, his advisors, uh, both in the military and, I, and, and in the State Department and outside, that this is a very important relationship. Uh, it's certainly a military alliance, but it's a big relationship, and that there is a lot of uh, nervousness in South Korea. I don't think there's been this much nervousness in South Korea about a presidential visit since Jimmy Carter came in 1978, <laughs> uh, w mm. threatening to withdraw all U.S. troops from South Korea because of South Korean human rights issues. That's a long time ago. A lot of nervousness. And so I think he rightly put the emphasis on uh, smoothing the waters, uh, having a very congenial uh, relationship-building series of, of opportunities with President Moon Jae-in, and making it very clear. He was very explicit yesterday in his uh, press appearance with uh, President Moon. He was asked, uh, we're worried about what the Koreans call Korea passing. You're just going to ignore us, even have a war without telling us. He was very clear. He called it Korea skipping. He said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I think that allows him now to go to Beijing, uh, with demonstrating having demonstrated that U.S. traditional alliances with the Republic of Korea, as well as Japan, are in good shape, that we're all on the same page when it comes to addressing North Korea. There still may be some scratchiness between Tokyo and Seoul that we'd like to see a little bit. We're on one page, and it strengthens his hand now in talking to Xi Jinping about next steps to, in fact, get North Korea to the table, uh, get to some kind of deal. Uh, but I think he's going to right. uh, uh, press uh, China to bring sufficient pressure on North Korea to make that inevitable. And Kathleen, the president seemed like he wanted to strike a deal with North Korea as well, saying that it made sense for the Pyongyang to come to the table. How far do you think the president is willing to go to try to get some type of deal with Kim Jong-un? Is it feasible? I think getting some talks going are feasible. Uh, I think there's a big question as to uh, what preconditions there might be to talks. If the precondition is that North Korea has to say, right, we're wrong, we're going to uh, denuclearize, uh, I don't think they're going to come to the table. I do also think, although there's a debate about this, it's going to take some more pressure. And I imagine President Trump will be looking to President Xi and actually others on this trip, as it goes on, to administer more <laughs> pressure. But if there is a readiness, and I don't know if there is on the part of uh, President Trump and his administration, to look at a step by step deal, uh, which would probably sure. start with uh, uh, the stop to testing and the return of inspectors and with some kind of reciprocal lifting of sanctions, then I think a deal is possible. But it will be a step-by-step -step deal. And like any other difficult negotiation, uh, it, will, it will not be complete within the first, uh, uh, within the first round or so. And this was the first time we've heard from the president acknowledging that perhaps we've seen some movement, he, she, he said, some progress when it came to reigning in Pyongyang. What positive signals are you seeing when it comes to the North Korea front? Are you as, just as optimistic as what the president was saying yesterday? Uh, I, I actually don't know what he was referring to. Um, I guess we could take the absence of tests uh, over the past uh, some weeks uh, after a pretty vigorous cycle of tests uh, earlier in the year as a sign. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and North Korean rhetoric has cooled somewhat, just as I think 
President Trump's rhetoric has cooled. So perhaps this, this opens a space, and I have to hope that that's the case. But I don't see any concrete signs. I do think that North Korea, Kim Jong-un, remains absolutely committed to uh, keeping uh, what it will consider a viable nuclear deterrent, uh, along with a considerable missile capability. Set us up for what's going to happen in Beijing, because we were speaking to Wendy Cutler from the Asia Society earlier this morning, saying there's going to be a big difference between what we hear publicly in front of the cameras to what's going to be happening behind closed doors. Uh, yeah, I would imagine on the, on the trade issues that may well be the case. And, and on North Korea, Probably so, too. I, I, my own suspicion is that uh, uh, President Trump will, behind closed doors, uh, push very hard for uh, to Xi Jinping to do something pretty dramatic in terms of really tightening—this is just my guess—on uh, North Korea, for example, uh, cutting off oil uh, exports to North Korea. Uh, this is something that China has not wanted to do in the past, but I think President Trump may want to make the case that something like that, anyway, would be the the, the kind of final bit of pressure that uh, China could take in, in concert with the rest of the international community and then demonstrate that he's ready to uh, uh, to sit down at the table. Now, maybe he has some ideas, as I suggested, in his pocket about what uh, uh, the, the outlines of the deal would be. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that uh, the Chinese have some ideas about that, too, and they floated some of those, a freeze for a freeze, uh, negotiations that would include a peace treaty and so on. So I imagine there might be some discussion about that. What would a peace—I mean, if there is some type of peace treaty, then, would that actually disrupt, I guess, some of the, the relationships, I guess, with some of the U.S. allies with Japan as well as South Korea? I mean, this is coming at a time when we heard from South Korea uh, seeing a thaw in ties with China as well uh, after this detente that we saw uh, last week, after a pretty rocky political relationship uh, earlier this year over the deployment of THAAD. Does it shift the global dynamics here when it comes to where President Trump wants to align himself with, with, with its allies? I think it's too early to say that. Uh, it's, uh, President Trump has sent, over the course of his presidency, uh, some pretty mixed signals about uh, whether or not he's looking to really have a very special relationship, what used to be called a G2 relationship with China, or whether he wants to take the more traditional uh, approach of an American president, American foreign policy, of really relying upon our, our, uh, uh, our alliances and that, that web of uh, partnerships that we have uh, around Asia. They're not mutually exclusive. But but it's, it's a little unclear how, how he's going to balance that. With respect to a, a peace treaty or a peace regime on the Korean peninsula, this has long been in the works. But the question now is, with North Korea's uh, nuclear capability so advanced and with this determination to keep it seeming to be uh, so uh, strong, the approach of the United States, and for that matter, other countries, has been we can't really talk about these other things absent a, commi absent a commitment right. to denuclearize. Uh, you know, Kathleen, uh, I'm curious, just, uh, you know, because he's gone on the first two legs of his tour, you know, just you, you've seen how these, uh, how these, uh, these trips are done. What do you think, how do you think the Chinese so far have viewed what's happened in Japan and South Korea? How do they use that, uh, you know, seeing what's happened, the developments, how do you think they're going to leverage that with when Trump arrives in China? Well, I think, you know, to some extent, the Chinese might be somewhat encouraged that President Trump has taken a more conciliatory uh, approach and, and opened the door, seemed to pivot a little bit anyway, or maybe more than a little bit, to the notion that uh, it, we may be approaching the time for some kind of engagement uh, uh, with North Korea. Right. When it comes to hosting him, you know, the Chinese are masters, uh, master hosts, <laughs> and I think, uh, I think they'll have no problem in impressing President Trump. Uh, I think he already is impressed with uh, with. Right. The Chinese miracle. Right. They'll roll out the red carpet. Uh, Kathleen, just really quickly, though, you know, on the trade front, do you think that President Trump will be, will be able to make any headway, you know, if not on, uh, you know, if not, uh, you know, getting them to lower tariffs or, or using any of those levers, perhaps more market access for companies? Hey, we're talking about with South Korea? Uh, with, uh, excuse me, with, with China. With China. Um, yeah, I don't know. I uh, uh, I think that uh, there's going to be some emphasis on announcing some deals. I mean, again, if if it is, if Japan and, and South Korea uh, uh, indicate anything, it's that he's on this trip. He's really put a big emphasis on uh, American uh, defense sales and manufactured goods, and uh, uh, obviously our defense relationship with China is a bit different. But uh, he he may be kind of salesman in chief. That would be my guess.